All right, good morning. It's great to be together again today. I'm going to read a, a few verses out of Psalm 147. Psalm 147, as we begin this morning, as we worship together, it says here in verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers together the outcasts of Israel, he heals the brokenhearted, binds up their wounds, he counts the number of the stars, he calls them by, all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God. Father, I thank you, God, that that's what you call us to do. You tell us how beautiful it is. You tell us that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so, God, as we call out to you, as we cry out to you, as we sing to you, Lord, I pray that you would be here with us. Lord, we, we know you're with us all the time. We know that you're in us if we're a born-again believer in Christ. We know that you're upon us if we've, we've trusted for that, Lord. But God, we just ask that you would make your presence known this morning. That we would know that you are alive and active in our life and you are alive and active in this world. And we thank you for being who you are. So Lord, bless this time of worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, good morning. So uh, if you'd like to stand, if you're able. My soul thirsts for the living God. My soul thirsts for you, O Lord. My soul thirsts for the living God alone. My soul thirsts. My soul thirsts for the living. My soul thirsts for you alone. My soul thirsts for the living God
I know that too. The splendor of the King. We thank you that you are the God of the universe and yet you're the, you want to be the God of our hearts, Father God. And we just thank you for everything that you did um, on the cross, Lord, in order to uh, close that gap uh, between us, Lord. Because there's no other way that that gap could be closed. And we just thank you that uh, you um, came as a, as a humble child, Lord, and, um, and you just served your Father. Lord, you just had your, your eyes fixed on, on your Father. And we just pray that we... We'll do the same, Lord, in our lives and that we'll just fix our eyes on you uh, rather than uh, just on our own um, thoughts and ideas and, uh, and what we want, Father God, in Jesus' name.
step down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that You're my God You're all together lovely All together worthy All together
Father, I thank you that you are the one who is the giver of life, real life, true life, abundant life, everlasting life, the joy that comes with it, the hope, the love. God, we just thank you that that's what you bring into our life. Thank you, God, that we can stand here and praise you looking back on our life and see how faithful you have been to us. Regardless of how faithful we've been to you, you have never turned away. You have never let go. We thank you for that, God. I thank you that you've brought us here this morning to worship you, to praise you, to call out these things, to remind each other of who we serve and this great God we know. Thank you for these times that we have, that we can stand together and wash one another's feet with the water of the word, with the worship of Jesus, that we can stand here saying that we are clean and forgiven through the blood of Christ. God, you are so good. You are the giver of life. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Take a moment and uh, greet one another in the Lord. A few notices before we get into uh, the Word, and uh, we have a, a special testimony this morning as well. I uh, just wanted to mention again the upcoming uh, events that are going on here. We have a Ladies' Day on the 17th of November. Uh, it's Saturday from 10 to 4 at uh, the Portland Hall Hotel, which is just down in the center of Mansfield. So if you'd like to come out to that, it's going to be a great time. They're going to go through 1 Corinthians 13, as well as a character study of Leah, of how she was dealing with the, the lack of love and those kinds of things. So it's an amazing uh, it'll be an amazing time together as you can just fellowship, worship the Lord together and the rest. So uh, if you remember, if you went to Creation Fest with us, Joey Rozak and I uh, team taught sort of a, a New Believers Fellowship, and his wife is coming from Cambridge. 
to uh, do one of the sessions as well, Tiffany Rosick. So she'll be here uh, to do one of the sessions as well as Bethany. So if you want to talk with Lindsay, Lindsay's going to take the money on this one. Uh, we need to have a, a, a firm commitment on this one. Last time, you know, you could sort of, you know, you could come if you wanted to or not. But this one's a different setup, so we have to, you know, give them a, a set number that we uh, are going to be there. So we need to know by the 4th of, of November if you want to go. Uh, and uh, if you could give us your money on that day as well, that would be awesome. Or before that, Lindsay, you can talk with her, uh, and she can collect that for you. Um, but this week, in staying with the women's theme, we have the women's Bible study going on on Tuesday, 7.30, at the coffee shop. They'll be going through 1 Corinthians as well uh, during that, leading up to 1 Corinthians 13. So if you want to uh, come out to that, it'd be great, 7.30. If I can encourage you, the hardest part is stepping out your front door, you know? That's the hardest part, you know? All the doubts and all the things and all the tiredness, but once you shut your front door, it just, everything changes. So I can encourage you, just try that part and try to come out to those things. And then on Wednesday night, we have the Home Fellowship as well. The Home Fellowship is going to change a little bit. I think uh, we've sort of been limiting it because we've been discussing the book of Ezra or those kinds of things, in which is a, Tuesday, a Wednesday night study, and there's not as many people being able to take part in that. So we're going we're gonna to actually discuss the Sunday morning teachings from now on. So there'll be more people who've actually gone through that first to be able to have part, take part in the discussion. So th- it's going to be changed to discussion of the book of Acts as we start that this morning. And the home fellowship will take place uh, 7.30 on Wednesday night as well. And then also we have the Chesterfield Bible study going on on Wednesday night as well. So if you'd like to go out to that. And I don't think that's this week, is it? It's next week, yeah. Okay, and lastly is this, uh, again, I want to mention the upcoming tour of the British Museum and Library on the 28th of December. Uh, we will be leaving here about 7.30-ish in the morning, something like that, from Kingsway Hall, taking a, a coach down there together. Uh, and again, if you've never heard about this, this is a, a really an amazing tour. So if you can make it, please try. It does cost 20, 20 quid for the, for the coach and an optional, optional five-pound donation to the guy leading the tour. He doesn't charge, and so we like to give him a little bit of a gift. He also has little booklets of the actual tour that he is, uh, takes us on. Uh, those are five pounds, but they are very uh, good. Some of us didn't buy them last time and then had to go back and buy them because they were so good because uh, it's, it's just so much information. You know, it's great to know. Even today, we're going to talk about the fact that we have a faith that is, that is believable and true. And it's nice that we can go and sit and look at artifacts from 4,000 years ago and say, this is, there's the flood, here's the flood. You know, it's the same, and it's there uh, from 4,000, 6,000 years old uh, stuff. So uh, if you can come out to that or want to go with that, that'll be a great time to gather. So those are the uh, uh, notices that we have. I don't think I'm forgetting one, except for the um, next week we'll be having the... Uh, the meeting, the church meeting that will be taking place next Sunday night, 6 o'clock. If you uh, can make it out, it's going to be here in this place. Uh, it's for those who have made Calvary Chapel their church home or are thinking about making it their church home. Uh, you can come out. We're going to talk about where we're going and the visions and the values and sort of the financial situation, all that stuff that, that some don't really care about and others people able to do. So uh, that will be going on on Sunday night. So it, 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 we are going to broadcast it. Uh, but it's not going to be just straight from the website. It, I think the link is from the website, but you have to have a passcode to actually access that. So if you can't make it out, if you have kids and you can't come or whatever, uh, you will be able to catch that. If you talk to Paul and get the password from him or uh, from, from me, if you like that, although I don't know it, but uh, <laughs> I, I would better talk to Paul. He did give it to me, but that doesn't mean I know it. So uh, yeah, so that's going to be happening next Sunday night, 6 o'clock um, here uh, as we discuss those things. Uh, before we get in the Word this morning, um, I, I've asked Andrew Ward to come up and uh, share a little bit. I don't know if you've known Andrew, but Andrew's been coming for a while. And he is going to be going to Gambia on a, a short-term trip in December. And so I've asked him to come up so we can be praying for him and how we can support him. Andrew, you want to come up and, uh, and share? Yeah? Yeah, so uh, it's been great to get to know him over the last few months, but he'll... I don't want to take too much of his thunder, so I'll let you uh, explain all those kinds of things, yeah? All right. Hey, should we pray? Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you and praise you for the privilege of standing here and testifying of your glorious work. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for answered prayer. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for pouring out your many blessings, and I give all the glory and praise back to you. 
in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, I've called my testimony Go, the Gambia, December the 11th, 2012, based on Luke chapter 24, verses 46 to 49. I'd like to thank Pastor Bryce for the opportunity of coming to share what God is doing in my life and for allowing me to step out of my comfort zone. <coughs> <Huh>? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, sorry I've had to write everything down. I just didn't want to miss anything what God's been doing. Um, it may sound like a Mills and Boone love story, but I can assure you it's a love story in, <laughs> in the Lord Jesus. Um those people that have already heard snippets uh, of testimonies in the Bible studies, um, I do apologise. You'll probably hear them again. But as Bruce says at Creation Fest, here's the full Monty. <laughs> uh, on a more serious note, I give all the glory to the Lord. It's been all about, all about faith and trusting in the Lord. That the seed he had sown in my heart and the vision he had given, he would see it accomplished if it was the will of the Lord. The Lord has richly blessed me with answered prayer and is still doing. The vision for the outreach for souls in the Gambia. The Gambia lies on the west coast of Africa on the Ivory Coast with a population of which is made up of 88.8% Muslims, 6.7% traditional ethnic faiths, 4.1% Christian. 0.4% the Baha'i faith. The average income per person per year is 320 US dollars, which is around 200 pound per year. I have previously been blessed with two visits to the Gambia, otherwise known as the Smiling Coast, but never managed to find a born again Christian church in the truth. A Calvary Chapel is yet to be planted. Earlier in the year, I decided to look on the internet for Christian churches in the Gambia. Only a few examples came up, but only one appeared to be teaching the truth. I read the teachings in the newsletter, which really blessed me and touched my heart. It was Pastor Chris Lawrence from the Gambia Church of God. Having read his newsletter and studied the word in his teachings, I decided to contact him to ask if his services prayer and Bible studies were conducted in English. He replied saying yes. I thanked him for God blessing me with the truth of his teaching and if ever I was back in the Gambia, I would be attending his church. Shortly after, I came to church and Pastor Bryce brought the word from the Lord and he preached, go, the last chapter of Luke. Luke chapter 24, verses 46 to 49 read, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. I felt so convicted and empowered by the Holy Spirit that I really felt I needed to go. Especially when the words came, whether you work in an office or a hospital, God chooses the most ordinary people. And I'm certainly no evangelist. I pray constantly about the will of the Lord, not of myself, but by faith that God was calling me to Africa. I cycled to Rother Valley Country Park and laid by the waters praying. I read the whole of the epistle of Paul to the Galatians. These words richly bless me. Galatians 2 verse 20 read, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I continued to pray, reading the word and trusting in the Lord by faith, believing that his will would be done. I visited the travel shop for prices of flights to the Gambia. 600, 700 pound quoted just was not in my price range for a week's visit, although if God really wanted me there by faith, 
I know he would have sorted the finance. A call came from the manager of the shop, travel shop a week later. If I was prepared to go on the 11th of December to Banjul, just before Christmas, I could fly for approximately £300. As people didn't travel much during the weeks leading up to Christmas, this was perfect as it would give me time to plan for mission. The fare had been halved. I only had a week's holiday left at work, but would, would I be allowed to go two weeks before Christmas? This was not normally allowed, as everybody wants this time off because of the stress of last minute present buying and Christmas shopping. I submitted a holiday form to my line manager, praying over it in Jesus' name. She turned and said to me, are you going away? I said, yes. She immediately signed it and gave it back to me. My heart was rejoicing, thanking God for yet again answered prayer. I didn't even have to explain my cause or where I was going. The Gambia trip was booked. I originally saw myself working voluntary in the hospital in Banjul, but God closed the door. I realized that I am to work for the Lord, reaching out to the lost souls of this nation, bringing the truth to the lost souls of the Muslim people. I wait on the Lord upon my arrival for his guidance. I questioned to myself, how was I able to get around the villages without any form of transportation? The travel agent was contacted again. I booked my bike on the aeroplane at a cost of 20 pound each way. I intended it to go only one way leaving it for the church in the Gambia for soul outreach. Having read the pastor's newsletter, I was made aware that there were small church establishments, five in total around the Gambia, which made up the Gambia Church of God. Five churches, five pastors or leaders, five villagers needing transportation for soul outreach. I kept hearing the song by Katie Mellow, a non-Christian, there are nine million bicycles in Beijing. That's a fact. But very frail ones in the Gambia at a great cost. <laughs> the vision now was to take five bikes on the aeroplane. The travel agent was yet again contacted. I asked if it would be possible to take five bikes on the aeroplane one way. She contacted the head office and they replied with a positive answer, yes, £20 each way. I prayed about the whole of the situation was fitting together like a jigsaw puzzle. The pastor in the Gambia was emailed and all was going well. During the following two Wednesdays, I attended both Bible studies at church, the one in Chesterfield and the one in Mansfield. I shared this very testimony of what God was preparing me to do for the church. Within a week, the Lord had blessed me with over 600 pound which meant that five mountain bikes were now paid for, complete with mud guards and lights, and the shipping cost had been paid. I also received £100 given for Bibles, which has bought 50 New King James Bibles. They arrived this week. Five New Testaments were also given. The bike shop had offered me free making up of the bikes and a free toolkit per bike, which meant the bikes could travel fully erected and not boxed. At the end of the week, I went to the travel agent to pay for the transportation of five bikes. I was then told that I could only take one bike and it had to be boxed. My heart dropped and my faith suddenly started to question. After much negotiation with the manager, her contacting the head office in the airport, she finally came to the decision that the airline would allow the bikes to go, but the airport authority and the baggage handling would not allow five to go. I shared my testimony with the travel agent manager. I left her with my bank details in faith and asked her to process £100 and to reconsider con contacting the airport manager. I phoned every day, there was no, no news. The airport manager was hard to get hold of. Three days went by, fully submitted in prayer and secretly fasting. All I knew was that the pastor in the Gambia was expecting five bikes which now couldn't travel. I was blessed with the word which I needed as I became very anxious and worried. Paul's epistle to the Philippians chapter four verses six and seven. 
Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I no longer needed to lay in bed wondering what was happening. God had it all under control, but easier said than done. I guess the words, be still and know that I am God, finally hit home and I managed to get some shut eye. <laughs> in the 80s, a gospel singer from Lincoln called Chris Burwater sang a song called Here I Am from the album Time for Tears. I kept hearing the words and singing it to myself. The words went like this. The fields are white unto harvest, but oh, the labourers are so few. So Lord, I bring myself to help the reaping, to gather precious souls unto you. Here I am, holy, available. As for me, I will serve the Lord. I made this my prayer and left everything in the hands of the Lord. Next door to where I live is an open field which recently had a cereal crop growing in it, now harvested with the bales left. I decided to take the word out into the middle of the field and pray. This time, having looked up the aircraft type I was flying on, I was praying for the cargo and whole door to open to the will of the Lord. Not specifically for five bikes to go, as I knew I would need extra kilograms for the mission. I'm sure Eckington, where I live, must have thought that they had a new resident scarecrow in the field. <laughs> if anybody had seen me, praise the Lord. I literally stood in the harvest field, reading the word and holding it up to the Lord whilst praying. Matthew chapter 17, verses 20 and 21 came to light. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for, I sure, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a, as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. I came home from the field, strong in faith, and just knew what the bikes would be going. I could see them being loaded through the whole door. I switched the radio on to hear UCB's word for today. It was Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. The following day, the nurse at work decided to share information about Revelation TV and how the teaching had really blessed her. I explained I didn't have a TV, which was my choice not to have one but might be able to watch past teachings on the computer. I went home that evening to listen to the group discussion on Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Before I went to bed, I checked the answer machine on the home phone, no message. I switched my mobile on to discover a voicemail. Lord, please don't let it be another freebie weekend top up. It was the manager from the travel agent. The message was one of apology, saying sorry for the way I had been treated and that five bags were now booked on the aeroplane. They could travel just as they were, not boxed, but fully erected, and the money had been processed. <laughs> a receipt from head office was waiting for me to take to the airport in the manager's drawer. All airline parties accepted responsibility of shipping the bikes. Guess who got the biggest box of chocolates the following day? <laughs> a Christian brother had volunteered to help take the, the bikes to, the, to Birmingham Airport the same evening. Meanwhile, Pastor Chris replied to my email, which read, Good morning, Brother Andrew. It's a blessed morning here in the Gambia. Good morning. I give praise to our Lord and mighty Saviour, Jesus Christ, for raising you up for his church here in the Gambia. I also thank you sincerely for those bicycles for soul outreach. Hallelujah. God bless you, Brother Andrew. 
please do let us know your flight schedule and we will be there to receive you at the airport. Personally, Brother Andrew, the church here needs helpers. There is a high revival in the Gambia. We see it in our church here. The spirit of the Lord has been mighty in our midst. Contrary, a high level of persecution rose against the Gambians that gave their lives to Christ, especially concerning their education. I say this because I know God will raise someone for his church here. The highest sponsors of education here is the Muslim organizations from Arabia and the Irish organizations through the Roman Catholic mission. We have brothers and sisters Gambians who have been deprived by Catholic mission because they dedicated their lives to Christ, most of them in secondary school. The most painful one is a brother who is in second year in the university. His scholarship has been taken. All of them are happy in the midst of these because they've fallen in love with the Lord. That's, that was why I said it's personal. I would like them to continue school to the glory of God. Brother Andrew, if there are believers around you with the love for such people, please let them know. More personally, if you have used mobile phones with internet access, please come with them. Your used phones are always better than the Chinese phones sent here. They don't last in our hands. Even if there is a used but still working iPad, even better, a brand new one, may the Lord who saved and kept you hitherto keep you till you see him face to face. Pastor Chris. A second email arrived which read, Good evening, Brother Andrew. Your concern for the name and glory of Christ Jesus here in the Gambia is a sure sign that the Lord's hand is upon you. Thanks for responding to what he is doing in the last days. The whole world is preparing unknowingly for the second coming of, king, of our King, our Lord Jesus. You are part of those chosen to hasten the coming of the Lord. Amen. God bless you, Pastor Chris. I believe there are no coincidences when it comes to the things of God. I recently went away with my dad to celebrate his 70th birthday. I was walking down the main street in Aberdeen and came across this sign. I took a photo. What seed is sown in your heart? Matthew 13, verse 1 to 12. We stopped off in the Shetland Islands and ended up gazing through the window of a mission charity, Christian mission charity shop. The shop was closed, but I managed to attract the lady inside who was working. I saw these praying hands in the window. Which I wanted to purchase. They were made in Africa. She asked me if I was a Christian and she introduced herself from the New Life Church, Shetland. She said she had been waiting for someone to come along to give an old wooden book of prayer and psalms to. I was so blessed and not even charged. It was a gift from God. I made a donation. I ordered a CD from America called Devotion Newsboys. Instead, I got a substitute called Go Newsboys. I opened it up to find a man on a bike in the desert. The CD came from Germany. I knew it was God confirming to go. I borrowed Bryce's Operation World to study and read up on Gambia and prayer needs, only to find the prayer day was the 13th of May, the day I was born. God knows us by name before we were even born. What seed is sown in your heart? If there are just two things that God wants you to know today, it doesn't matter what you're facing in this life today. Just trust in him. Lay your life down for him. Read his word and pray continuously, adhering to what he has to say. Second, it's all about faith. Remembering Creation Fest 2012, Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Other prayer needs are for writing pads and packs of big ink pens. The finance to purchase 2,000 Bible tracts from Calvary Chapel Shop, California. One stakes the best gift in the world. One stakes Jesus and the Quran, they're for adults. One stakes God knows my name, they're going to be for young children. One stakes kids, you are special, they're going to be for teenagers. 
Bags of sweets and lollipops for children in the village compounds of which the children's Bible tracts will be fastened to. These will be thrown into the compounds so I don't get attacked <laughs> with swarms of children. They always seem to appear from nowhere as previous experience when sweets are involved. <laughs> the teenage tracts will be fastened to the writing pads and packs of pens. These will be given out. Yesterday I went to watch on church, Alfreton, to the opening of the church. We sang the song, These Are the Days of Elijah. The second verse went like this. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are days of your servant David, rebuilding the temple of praise. These are the days of the harvest. The fields are as white in the world. And we are the laborers in the vineyard declaring the, the words of the Lord. A brother in the Lord afterwards gave me a telephone number and said, contact this person. He will send out free booklets all over the world for mission and translate them into different languages. I got home and left a message. Watch this space. Thank you for listening and please pray for the people of the Gambia. And I give all the glory to the grace and mercy of God by faith in Christ Jesus, of which he has poured out upon us by his omnipresent Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Stay on for All right, let's pray for Andrew. Father, I thank you, God, that uh, you have called a guy to go, and I thank you, Lord, that you use normal, everyday people who just want to have faith and believe that you are as good as you were in the Bible. You're the same God today. God, we thank you that that's the truth. Bless him, be with him, provide the last thing, lead him step by step. And uh, Lord, just open those doors you have for him, God. And we thank you for his faith and his desire to go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Andrew. All right, well, one of the reasons I wanted Andrew to come up and uh, share this morning was uh, what we are about to study. And, and, and if you have a Bible, we're going to be in, Luke, in Acts chapter 1 as we start uh, a journey through the book of Acts. I won't tell you how long it's going to be, but uh, more than a couple days. But uh, one of the things I love about it is that, is that if, you, if you read the book of Acts, and, or if you've never read the book of Acts, you can turn with me to... Acts chapter 28, the very last chapter, and the very last couple of verses, I want to read verse 30 and 31 uh, before we begin, and I love it because it starts, or it, it, it ends, I guess, it ends in verse 30, it says, then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus with all confidence, no one forbidding him. And so that's how this book ends, which for me is kind of a, you know, as we get into it, as we study it, it's kind of a weird place to end, I'll just tell you from my point of view, because there's not really an ending point. Paul is left in under house arrest, he's there for two years, he's preaching to whoever, and that's it, you know? There's no end, there's no sort of, he dies, you know, according to, the, according to tradition, he was killed by the sword, there was no... no uh, uh, not at this point. He actually let go, a lot of people think, and he was rearrested later. All that's not even there. And, and one of the reasons I wanted Andrew to come this morning is the fact that I think the reason that it ends that way is because it's still going on. Because in verse of chapter 1, as we, as we start it, if you turn back there, it starts, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And so he says, this is a two-part series, the book of Acts and the book of Luke. Those are his two parts. He's written the book of Luke. We've studied that. We've gone through that. It took us about two years to get through the gospel of Luke. And as we went through it, he finishes with Jesus sort of ascending into heaven. But he, he, he starts it here saying, writing to the same guy, Theophilus, whether he's a guy, whether it's a code name for a church, there's different ideas about what that is. But he says, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. You see, Jesus began it there in Luke, and he's continuing it today in the body of Christ. He's still writing the book of Acts today in people who are wanting to trust God and say, I want to follow you, I want to believe that you are good. Now, people make, uh, in my opinion, people make two real mistakes with the book of Acts. You err on the side that 
The book of Acts was a time that God was doing special things, specific things. Things where that, that these, are, these were the times of the apostles and those times are over now. It's a different sort of dispensation or a different time or a different way God works in our life. He uses the word of God. He uses our intellect. He uses our reasoning. But he doesn't, with these kinds of miracles and healings and tongues and all that kind of stuff, that, that was all for the apostles' time. And, and so God has changed the way he works. And, and it sort of relegates that idea of miracles and all those kinds of healings to that period of time. And then there's another side, the side that we would seem to err more on, and that is, why don't we see more of these things today? Why aren't we seeing the healings and the miracles and all of those kinds of things going on today? And I I feel like that gets into a little bit of error, because what we forget is that the book of Acts covers 30 years of story, from the time of Jesus' ascension till his, until Paul is left in prison. It's at least 30 years And so when you're thinking about 30 years, and it's not just one church, it's not just the church of Jerusalem, it's not just the church at Ephesus or Philippi or Antioch, it's several different churches over two continents, uh, 30 years apart, and all of that is condensed down into 28 chapters. So it looks like one thing is happening right after the next, and it's just constant. But that's not the case. If you're going to write about something and you're going to write the story of the church, would you write, and we went to church today. And then the next Sunday, and we went to church today. You know? And then the next Sunday, and we went to church today. No, you would, you would focus on that one week where Paul's you know, sweat rags were brought in and, and, and they were put on somebody and he was healed. That's what you would focus on. You would bring that out. But only one town, Ephesus, saw that. No no other towns. It doesn't say that any other towns saw that specific miracle. And so when we're looking at the book of Acts, we need to remember that this is a long period of time. And if you've been going, and we've been going for 12 years in this church, and we've seen miracles, we've seen healings, we've seen lives change, we've seen a lot of things. But there's been a lot of time of, and they went to church. (laughs) There's been a lot of that in between. That's part of the life of Christ, is that sometimes it's really, really exciting and wonderful, and sometimes it's just sort of mundane, one foot in front of the next, waiting for God to work in our life. In fact, then these guys were told to wait for the promise of the Father. They were told to wait. Waiting is part of the life of the church. And, and I believe that these kinds of things are active and, uh, and available to us, but they don't happen every day. Now, I don't think we should say, well, let's just not worry about it. But when we're thinking about these kinds of things, and we're going to look at all of this, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the empowering of the Spirit, the different works of the Spirit, how the church reached out, all of those kinds of things, some of it we need to look back again and be reminded. You know, when, I, when I've talked to people who have said and, and, and sort of slated the church today, not necessarily this church, but the church today, it's often because we don't see these kinds of miracles. Why aren't we seeing that thing? Because the church is uh, in hypocrisy and all the rest. And I, I don't, you know, there are churches that way, of course. I, I'm not saying there aren't. But, you know, I look at it in a little bit different way. Why aren't we seeing revival and all of that stuff? Well, when you actually look at what they did, you know, how many of us are willing to go out in order to preach the gospel and get shipwrecked three times, you know? Anybody want to go out? I mean, after the second time, I might go, I'm not sure if I want to do this again. I'm not sure if I can last another one. How many of us would be beaten with rods? How many of us would be, would be stoned and left for dead? And then go back to the very city that did that twice, at least. I mean, most of us would go, okay, I, I, they just didn't like me there. I'm not going to go back and talk to them anymore, you know. And we would go in a different direction. Well, the reason so much was going on is that Paul gets stoned at a place. They leave him for dead. He pops up and goes back into the very town that he, now, it's not a town like this. It's a smaller village, you know. Of course, they would have seen him. There's not that many streets in the town. And, and so he goes back in. He comes back to the same place later on, you know. They met from the church house to house, and they met day to day. Now, again, different culture. You know, you go to Middle Eastern cultures and villages today, and the houses are all around. There's not much in the houses, and so you live outside the house. The weather's beautiful, and so you sit in the shade, and you sit and talk, and that's the culture of that time and, and still today. And so it's a different, a different situation. But how many of us will want to say, oh, why aren't, why aren't we seeing these things today? 
But instead of actually meeting together or inviting a friend over, a Christian friend, and praying together or going to Bible study, we'll choose to go here or do that or do this or do that. And then we wonder why we're not seeing these kinds of things. That's why I love what Andrew was saying, is that he heard from Luke chapter, the end of Luke chapter 24, saying, go, and he is like, okay, I don't know what that means, I'll go, you know, and, and God has led him each step of the way. We've talked about it in Ezra on Wednesday night, the idea that when Ezra was at the edge of civilization, he was about to go into the desert carrying three and a half million pounds worth of gold, he suddenly has this realization going, you know, there's only 1,500 of us, and we have a lot of women and children. We're going to move really slow. We're going to walk through this desert, and there's, there's bandits everywhere, and we didn't ask for any soldiers to go with us, but he was ashamed to go back to the king. That's what he says. He was ashamed. Why? Because he said, I'm a follower of God. And I just told this king that this God is amazing, and he's strong, and he's with anybody who will, who will trust him. And that's what I just said to that king, and now I'm faced with actually stepping over this final canal, this river, and trusting him with three and a half million pounds of gold to get to Israel for four months later. And he's like, you know what, we need to pray and fast and ask God to protect us and guide us. And they did, and, and they made it. And I think God is looking for people who will actually say, you know what, I want to study this, I want to know about it, I want to look at it, but Jesus, it says here that Jesus began both to do and to teach. He taught it, but he did it. He actually walked out these doors and said, you know that what she was talking about today? You know that what God is dropping in my heart right now? Boy, I need to really, when we open those doors, that's when we, we begin to go, okay, now I've got to walk that out. And that's what he is saying. These are the things that Jesus began to do and teach, and now it's time for God to work in the church. Now, the book of Acts was written about, about 64. There's different arguments about you know, when it was, somewhere around then, about, about 30 years after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. And as it says there, he says, Hey, Theophilus, you know, I, I told you about these things before. I wrote that you would know what you believe, the certainty of what you would believe. That's what he said in the Gospel of Luke, that you might know the certainty of what you believe. Because it's important for us to know the certainty of what we believe, isn't it? Because we are saying there is a heaven and there is a hell. I, I want to make sure that's the case, you know? I don't want to walk out to people and say, you know, there's a heaven and there's a hell and you need to change your life and I'm not really sure if there is or not. And, and you know, I kind of hope there is, you know, and those kind of, well, not a hell, but I hope a heaven, you know. But, you know, we want to make sure. We want to make sure that Jesus actually did what he said he was going to do. You know, there are people out there today that will say, well, it doesn't really matter if Jesus rose from the dead because his life was such an example and we can just follow that example. And I'm like, <laughs> that's not what I think. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he said, be perfect. Well, I fail. Uh, not not going to do it, not going to be able to do it. So I'm glad that he's risen from the dead. And so now he's saying that, hey, Unto this day, verse 2, unto this day in which he, he has taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit, having given commandments to the apostles whom he have chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And I, this is probably as far as we'll get this morning, but, you know, these three verses, this introduction, as he writes to this Theophilus, and he says, look, uh, what I've written before is that until the day he was taking up, he was giving commandments to his apostles. Now that word, I, I like the, how he says it, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments. I like the way that says that, because when, when we talk today, we hope that the Holy Spirit speaks through someone. Andrew is up here. We hope the Holy Spirit speaks through Andrew. But this is saying that Jesus spoke through the Holy Spirit. Now, what is he trying to say? Now, you know, there's different ideas about that, but I, I kind of think that it wasn't until, if, you, if, you, if you, your Bible's open, John chapter 20, verse, or, yeah, verse 20, verse 21, or chapter 20, verse 21, it says, Jesus said to them again, peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And so Jesus has appeared to the disciples after he's risen from the dead, before he's ascended, verse 22, he says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And it's that moment there, after Jesus rose from the dead, that he breathed on his apostles that they received the Holy Spirit. They were born again. That's what I, I 
see in that text, that they were born again, that the Spirit went into their heart and into their life, and they were born again, and their spirit communed with the Holy Spirit, and they began to understand. And so when Jesus says here, or when Luke says here, that Jesus said he preached through the Holy Spirit, it's that idea there that after the resurrection, he caused them to be born again, and then he began to give commandments to them that were interpreted by the Holy Spirit in their life. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, before I was a Christian, I'd read the Bible. I thought it was the most boring book I've ever read in my life, you know? I, I didn't understand it. I thought, what, what is the big deal? Millions of people are reading this stuff, and, and God is really angry, and he wants to kill this, and this is just boring. But all of a sudden, you get the Holy Spirit in your heart, and that same text you read, all of a sudden, is the command for my life. Go into all the nations, as, An- as Andrew said. And and it totally takes on a completely different level when God is speaking to us. Jesus is speaking to me. Because the Holy Spirit is now in my life, and he begins to, as I hear the words of Christ through the Bible, and and I have the Spirit in my heart uh, uh, interpreting that or helping me understand that, I begin to see these are the commandments that I am to go and do. And now that is the part that's got to be mixed with faith. I talked about that last week as well. This whole idea that you can talk about this stuff all day long, but unless it's mixed with that Holy Spirit and that belief in our hearts, then it doesn't do any good. But verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs. And so he says here that the Spirit came in, that, the, that Jesus was speaking to, him, to them through the Spirit, and that he began to prove to them that he was alive. Now, today there are lots of... Uh, myths about Jesus. And I think it's important that we know how to answer some of those myths. You know, because people will come up and they'll say, Jesus never lived. You know, that one, that one's so, I guess, ridiculous that, that I don't even want to try to answer that one because it's, it's just ridiculous. Every, there's several historians, there's whole movements. I mean, even the most staunch atheists and, and agnostics think that Jesus actually lived. It, it's not that part. So I'm not really going to discuss that too much, that he was just a mythical guy that was made up. That, that's just ridiculous. But there are others that, that people will, will still try to say. You know, a billion people believe Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. A billion Muslims believe that it wasn't actually Jesus that died on the cross. The Quran said that he changed the form of his face and somebody else died on the cross in his place. Now, you know, there's a billion people in the world who believe that. Now, it it sounds weird to us that are Christians, but a billion people, that's a lot of people who think that. And, And yet, how would we answer that? Well, there's there's several reasons why. One is that here it says that he proved by many infallible proofs or sure or testable things that that he rose from the dead. Now, it's important that we know that you can never prove that Jesus rose from the dead beyond any doubt because there's some irrational doubts. People can just doubt because of doubt. But there's reasonable uh, proof. You know, it's like saying, you know, you're driving down the road. I got in an accident recently. Somebody hit me in the, in the side. Not my fault, I'm sure. But, um, you know, I, I got hit. And now that lady could have said to me, a, a meteor fell from the sky and it hit your car, you know. And it's happened. 1972, I think it was. A meteor hit and hit it. The car goes on tour. You can go around and see it. It's been around people looking at it. It's kind of wild. I didn't actually think that would happen, but I found out it did. But so it can happen, you know. And so she says, no, I I didn't hit you. A meteor fell from the sky and hit you. You know, there's doubt. It's irrational because her car is damaged. And if it was the woman that hurt me, her car was in the grassy verge, crashed into a sign. So it was pretty obvious that she hit me, you know. My car had her color of paint. Her car had my color of paint. Obvious that we, we sort of hit each other. But you could try to come up with these irrational doubts that, that well, it could be this and it could be that, and, 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 and you're just like, this is ridiculous. That's this whole idea of the swoon theory or, or the fact that Jesus didn't really die on the cross or was somebody else. I mean, seriously, you know, for one, Mary, his mother, is standing there at the foot of the cross looking up at her son. So Mary is standing there. All she would have had to do is go, <laughs> that's not my son. <laughs> this is great, and walk away. But she didn't. She stood there and watched it. The Romans, uh, well, they did crucifixion quite a lot, and you know, and if they, if your prisoner escaped and you uh, allowed it, well, you suffered the same fate as them. So the soldiers that hung Jesus there had a vested interest to make sure that was Jesus hanging on the cross, you know. 
they picked him up from uh, the Pilate's house and carried him or took him or followed him all the way to the cross. And so they had a vested interest to make sure that was Jesus on the cross. Now, I think, I believe in a powerful God, and I think God actually could change his appearance to be somebody else. He could do it. I, he, we have a strong, powerful God. But the problem is the Old Testament says that Jesus was actually going to die, as we've said before, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. And so the Old Testament would actually say, well, God could do it, but God didn't do it because God said he was going to die. And so that whole theory is, is pretty, just, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. And now others would say that Jesus did die, but he didn't actually, or he did get crucified, but he didn't actually die. He swooned. You know, he sort of fainted. And so they put him in the tomb. Three days later, he woke up, you know, and goes, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm alive. And he w walked out. You know, again, a, a pretty crazy that we would actually hold to that because that truth would say that Jesus didn't actually die. He fainted. And when they stabbed him in the side, they didn't really stab him from down and into up and didn't really hit his heart. It just sort of went in somewhere, I don't know, but didn't kill him. And so it just went in, blood and water poured out. It wasn't really his pericardium of sack that, that burst and all that. It wasn't all that stuff, okay? And so he went into the tomb, he was buried in the tomb, and, and he got up, moved a massive stone that the women were like, how are we going to move that thing? He's got his feet pierced, his hands pierced, his side pierced, his back has been beaten raw, uh, 39 stripes, uh, 40 stripes minus one, that was the way they said it, because 40 stripes was just so cruel that most people died. 39 stripes, or 40 stripes minus one, was the idea that they took him to the edge of his life. That's what this would have been. His back was ripped open. The Bible said he was marred more than any man. And this guy moves this stone, walks out. There's no blood on the ground to follow him, that he's actually bleeding. Walks out past the guards that are there and goes to his, his um, uh, disciples and convinces them that he's actually risen from the dead. Could you imagine the bloody mass that would walk through your door? I, I'm, I've risen from the dead. You know, well, you, what are you talking about? You're a zombie. You know, that's what he would look like. But yet, people would rather believe that's the case than actually what the Bible says. Now, others would say that the, that the, the, the disciples decided to sort of lie about it. You know, that they, he, he really died. They've got him buried somewhere, and they made up this big story. Okay, again, let's look at the evidence there. You have the disciples who were actually there, who all went to their death in order to proclaim that Jesus rose from the dead. All Peter would have had to do when they were crucifying him upside down as they're about to nail his hand. Okay, uh, just lying, you know. But no, they, they put one, one uh, stake in this hand, another in this, into his leg. He's hanging there on the cross. At any point, he could have said, I didn't really, we, we made the whole story up. Not one of them got rich, <laughs> you know. Not one of them did any sort of, had any sort of benefit from it. They were persecuted, they were beaten, they were outcasts. So they gained nothing from it except death. And yet these guys, all 12 of them or 11 of them, went to their death proclaiming that Jesus was alive when really they buried him in a tomb. Over, okay, could that have happened? I, I guess, but the probability of that happening is so small that the obvious one is that these guys saw a risen Christ. A risen Christ. It says there in verse 20, John chapter 20, verse uh, 24, Thomas is, is called a twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. Jesus appears to them, and Thomas is not there. Well, so Jesus comes in, and, and, and Thomas says in verse 25, Unless I see in his hands the print of his nails and put my finger into the print of, his, of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came to the door being shut, stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And so Thomas was doubting here, as we get knowing, doubting Thomas. And Jesus comes to him and says, here, put your finger in my hand. Put it in my side. I'm proving to you that I'm alive. He did this over and over and over again to make sure these guys understood that he was alive. 
Thomas, uh, as tradition says, went off to India and was martyred in India for his faith, proclaiming a risen Lord. And so when we're talking about this idea of the infallible proofs, you can believe one of these stories in order so that we don't believe in the truth, or we can actually just say, you know what, the Bible said this and it happened, the Bible said this and it happened, and Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem, and Jesus was going to be born of a virgin, and Jesus was going to be crucified, and there he's up on the cross, and it says that the guys were going to gamble for his, his, his clothes at the foot of the cross, and prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, at some point you have to kind of go, okay, uh, my car didn't get hit by a meteor, you know, I've got to believe the truth. And I've got to say that this is true. Now, the reason I wanted to say all that, and I didn't want to go much further, is that if this is true, it's true. That's an obvious statement, I know. But that means he's alive, and that means he's active, and that means he wants to do the same thing in our lives as he was doing in the first church. That's why this, that's why this uh, uh, book ends in such a strange way, because he's not done. He's continuing to do the work in the lives of people today. And so as we begin to look into this next week, as we start looking at the Holy Spirit and the promise of the Holy Spirit and the, and, and the power of the Holy Spirit, all of those things, we need to remember that we are worshiping and we are studying, we are learning about a man that rose from the dead and proved that he was alive by infallible proofs to guys that were there who then went to their death proclaiming that this guy rose from the dead and he has the answers to life. And so then when I begin to put that into my own life, that he's also got the answers for my life. He's also got the the direction for me. He's also got the power that I need. He's also got the presence of his spirit in my life to bring the joy and the hope and the, the goodness of God. And we can begin to believe this because he proved with many infallible proofs that he rose from the dead. May we be believing like Thomas. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God. I thank you that you are still writing that story. I thank you that you are still doing miracles. I thank you that there have been people in this room that have been healed by you from diseases, from conditions, from simple headaches. Lord, you work in our life. And others of us are in this room and we've not been healed by those things. I can't say I understand, Lord, why you heal one and why you don't heal another. I I don't know. But Lord, we are to trust. That's what we are to do. And just as you said to Peter, what's it to you if I want him to remain till the end? Lord, that's where we have to get our eyes off one another. Why does that person get that and I don't? Why does this person get healed and I don't? Why does this person get that good job and I don't? What is that to you? That's what you said. May we be faithful in our own life. May we be believing. And Father, I pray for those who are here today that maybe have never made that commitment, never been born again. Lord, that maybe today would be the day that there isn't really any other option. Either he swooned and he walked out on pierced feet. Either he didn't really die, somebody else died in his place. He died and he's just been buried and they all went to their death proclaiming something that's false, or it's just like he says it is. Lord, I thank you that that is the truth. I thank you, Lord, that there are many in this room that have proclaimed that already, and we have experienced the risen Lord ourselves. So, Father, I pray for those who have not. May that today be the day that they meet with the risen Lord, that the truth will set them free, that we will bow our knee and say, God, come into my life. Here it is, brokenhearted as I read in the Psalms. You restore, you strengthen, you forgive, and you do great things in. So Lord, may we continue to live for you this week. May we love you as we trust you and take those steps of faith you put in front of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing this one last song to end. Take these hands 
Thank you that we don't have to go to the, to the ends of the world, Lord, in order to serve you, Father. We thank you that people can go um, to the, um, the outermost places, Lord. But we thank you that you also want us to go uh, to our workplaces and um, to to our families, Lord. And, um, and just when we're meeting and greeting people, Lord, we, you want us to go and um, be witnesses, Father God whether we're, we're telling them with our words or just showing them with our lives, Lord. Just we thank you that you use all of us, Lord, in, in different ways, but it's not better ways, Lord. It's, it's all equal, Father. And so we thank you that we can serve you and that, we want, that you want us to 
um, to serve you. And we just pray that our hearts won't be closed and our hands won't be uh, together and our, uh, we, we won't just stand still, Father God, but we'll, um, but we'll be open to you and uh, listening um, and following you, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen.